Good morning, everybody. This is Mike Abramowitz. I am the president of Freedom House, and this is always my favorite day as the president of Freedom House. It is the release of our flagship report, Freedom in the World. Freedom in the World is our annual review of political rights and civil liberties in 210 countries and territories around the world. And Freedom in the World is celebrating a birthday this year. It is uh, turning 50. Uh, which means that it's uh, older than most of the staff at Freedom House, except sadly me. Uh, it was created during a period of really much like today in 1973, when there was considerable lack of confidence in the future of democracy. And one reason that I have a lot of hope for the future is that the world did this before. We turned around the trajectory of freedom and put on a good path for many years. For those of you who don't know Freedom House, we were founded in 1941 uh, under, with the core conviction that freedom flourishes in, a democ in democratic nations where governments are accountable to their people. And we do three essential things. We do research on the challenges and opportunities for democracy. We advocate for policy changes to advance freedom. And we provide direct support to defenders of democracy working on the ground uh, in sometimes in, in, in very problematic authoritarian settings. And we do so on a nonpartisan basis. And we are supported by the generosity of our donors. And if, if I'd like to take a moment just to thank those whose sponsorship makes freedom in the world possible. First, I'd like to thank our democracy defenders, uh, our core group of donors who stand by side by side with us in our year in our year to year struggle to achieve a world where all are free. This report would also have not been possible without the generous support of the Hereford Foundation, Google, the Yillens Poston Foundation, the Lilly Endowment, the Merrill Family Foundation, and the National Endowment for Democracy. I also want to mention our Freedom in the World Junior Fellowship Program, which gives young researchers critical work experience in the democracy and human rights field. And this program is generously underwritten by the Merrill Family Foundation with support from the Panther Foundation. I'm absolutely thrilled today to introduce our new, relatively new board chair, uh, Jane Harmon, uh, who joined Freedom House uh, last uh, October. And to quote her predecessor, Mike Chertoff, who's a good friend of hers, uh, Jane embodies the spirit of Freedom House with her long history of nonpartisan advocacy for the cause of democracy and dedication to tackling international security challenges. Jane has brought us incredible perspective at the intersection of democracy and security. She has served nine terms in the US Congress representing the California's 36th district. She was a ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, the chair of the Homeland Security Committee's Intelligence Subcommittee during her nine terms. Uh, she served on countless advisory boards that are too numerous to mention. And she also served for, I think, 10 years as the, uh, as the CEO of the Wilson Center. I'm gonna turn things over to Jane. We're so thrilled to have you with us. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this is fun for me. And uh, a couple of personal recollections before I uh, launch into uh, how exciting this report is. First, it was John Kennedy, President John Kennedy, who once said, uh, I am bringing Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris. And I remember that was a huge deal. Well, uh, or I accompanied Jack Jacqueline Kennedy in Paris. I accompanied uh, Mike Abramowitz in uh, uh, Munich, Berlin and London recently. And it was exciting to see, to meet some new people, introduce him to some people, but there are extraordinary supporters and future supporters of Freedom House in Europe and around the world. And, and it means a lot to me to be part of this. Second recollection is that uh, I got excited about politics because of John Kennedy. And I literally went to the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles, where I grew up, uh, in 1960, before Freedom House was born. No, after. After Freedom House was born. Right, excuse me, I can't add. But uh, on the floor of the convention, I met Eleanor Roosevelt. And the whole idea that she was a co-founder of this uh, amazing organization is inspiring. So um, nice to talk to people around the world uh, today and uh, to say a couple of things about this organization. First of all, it's a huge honor to lead the board and to succeed my brother by another mother, Mike Chertoff, uh, who is a very dear friend of mine, as Mike has said. 
More than 900 people have registered for today's uh, briefing, and it's thrilling to see the growing public interest in this report because it tells us that people, not just foreign policy professionals and lawmakers in national capitals, but people from all walks of life are increasingly invested in the state of global democracy. The first edition of Freedom in the World was published in 1973. That's why I got confused. Uh, it wasn't the founding. Uh, during the Cold War, with the aim of making policymakers more aware of the threats facing democracy. From my nearly two decades in Congress and more decades in politics and policy, I can confidently say that it has achieved that aim and it remains an invaluable tool for policymakers today. But over the past 50 years, its impact has grown far beyond the halls of government to help a broad array of people understand the health of democracy around the world, the threats we face and opportunities for positive change. Business leaders use Freedom House research to make investment decisions. Heads of state, lawmakers, prominent activists and Nobel Peace Prize laureates cite its findings. Equally heartening is to see its use in high schools and college classrooms where our futures, uh, future leaders will come from, helping to inform and inspire the next generation. As you know, especially if you've read previous year's reports, and I have, we are living through a time of democratic decline. Driven in large part by attacks on freedom of expression, democratic countries experiencing inter internal attacks on their institutions, and the persecution of disenfranchised or minority groups. Last year marked 16 years of decline. You'll hear in just a moment which, direct which direction things are headed in 2022, but the historical perspective that we take at Freedom House, as well as some hopeful findings in this year's report, Hopeful findings uh, give us reason to hope. Uh, give us reason to hope in the next 50 years, in, in the 50 years since the first Freedom of the World report, strong democracies have not only emerged from deeply repressive environments, but have proven to be remarkably resilient in the face of new challenges. Uh, I take great inspiration from those who have led the fight for freedom across decades and continents whose efforts have not been in vain and who continue leading us today. While 2022 was a profoundly challenging year in global democracy, it also brought us inspiring stories of resistance to tyranny and the bravery of ordinary people standing up for freedom. Let's remember that this time last year, most observers were pretty certain that Russian forces would take Kyiv within weeks. I'm wearing my Ukraine pin proudly and really hope that democracy will thrive this year in Ukraine as uh, Volodymyr uh, Zelensky has said he hopes it will. More than two years since the violent coup in Myanmar, the international community continues to deny the military junta the legitimacy it thrives. The, the white paper protests in China achieved meaningful policy change in one of the world's most authoritarian environments. And in Iran, let's focus on Iran, protests against mandatory uh, hijab, hijabs blossomed into a nationwide movement for freedom that has earned the admiration and support of freedom-loving people in the world over. And I salute Freedom House for recent uh, its recent letter and its recent efforts, especially highlighting what's going on in Iran. Global demand for freedom and democracy is stronger than ever. I believe that if democratic governments and societies support this fundamental desire for freedom uh, in word and also in deed, we'll have better news uh, to support in the coming years. And I look forward to the 2023 report, uh, hopefully showing an increase in democracy around the world. And with that, I'll turn over the presentation and big reveal. <laughs> over to Freedom House experts, uh, Adrian Shabazz, Vice President for Research and Analysis, and Yana uh, Gorakovskaya, one of the leading authors of Freedom in the World, to discuss the findings and recommendations from the latest report. And let me say again that Freedom House is strong because of its supporters, as Mike said, and because of its amazing staff, 
and because of this extraordinary board, which I am really honored to lead. So thank you very much and uh, welcome to some encouraging news about this uh, uh, 2022 report. By the way, if I may say one thing, we're gonna hear from Adrian and Yana to give the basic highlights of the report. And then we have a really sterling panel afterwards to discuss the implications of the report. So I really hope that people will stay for the whole, for the whole session. Over to you, Adrian. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Thank you, Congresswoman Harmon, for that very powerful introduction and to uh, for all of your dedication to this work over the over the years. Uh, hello, everyone. It's really great to be with you. I have the pleasure of uh, providing a brief overview of this year's findings. Uh, also, talk through our methodology, and then I'll pass it over to my colleague Yana for a regional overview uh, as well as some historical analysis. Uh, in addition to our donors, I wanted to take a moment to express my deep gratitude to our incredible network of more than 150 experts and advisors who work with us every year. Your dedication to this work always inspires us. I also want to thank our amazing team at Freedom House that is behind this giant undertaking. Uh, you've done a fantastic job this year and throughout all of the years. Each year, we produce scores and narrative reports on 210 countries and territories. Countries are assigned a, a score uh, on a 100-point scale, with 100 being the highest. And then that score translates to a rating of free, partly free, or not free. And we use those terms because we assess freedom as experienced by individuals, rather than evaluating government performance. So without further ado, let me get to this year's findings. As has been mentioned, our analysis suggests that the world may be approaching a historic turning point. Next slide, please. Global freedom declined for a 17th consecutive year. But, and this is a very important caveat, the gap between the countries that improved and those that declined was the narrowest that it's been since 2006 when the current democratic recession began. It's really notable that in 2022, only 35 countries experienced a decline compared to 60 in 2021 and 73 the year before. Many of the improvements this year are tied to an unwinding of disproportionate restrictions on protests and movement during the height at the, of the pandemic. We also saw several competitive elections that consolidated democratic norms, um, and we'll talk through those in greater detail throughout this presentation. So while we are hopeful, we remain clear-eyed about the serious challenges to democracy and human rights that re remain in place this year, and I'll walk through some of those in my next slide. The scale of this year's declines outweighed the improvements. And when you look at the top declines, sorry, next slide, please. The top declines points to our first trend, the assault on democratic institutions. This year's largest decline was in Burkina Faso, which dropped 23 points and changed from partly free to not free. This is a country that experienced two military coups in one year. Army officers suspended the constitution, dissolved the legislature, and even closed the country's borders. Our research shows time and time again that coups are incredibly disruptive to a country's democratic trajectory. Once core democratic norms are broken, it can take years and sometimes decades for them to be restored. Peru is a country with a history of political instability, having suffered a coup 30 years ago when Alberto Fujimori seized power and began a decade-long dictatorship. In 2022, the sitting president tried to remain in power by suspending Congress and declaring a curfew. And though Peru's Congress removed him from office and his vice president took over, this attempted self-coup sparked large protests that the police met with deadly force. And this country dropped from free to partly free in 2022. Another example shows the serious threat that democratic institutions face from incumbent leaders. Tunisia saw the third largest decline last year, and throughout the year, President Saeed worked to further consolidate his power. 
He formally dissolved parliament, held a flawed referendum on a new constitution, and gave the executive branch significantly more power. The opposition boycotted last year's parliamentary elections, where turnout was just 11%. And already this year, authorities are escalating their crackdown against opposition leaders and other critics. It's really disheartening to see because Tunisia had been one of the only countries to positively emerge from the Arab Spring. As Congresswoman Harman mentioned, two weeks ago marked one year since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, a brazen attempt to remove the democratically elected government in Kiev. The war shows how a country's democratic institutions can come under its assault from external actors as well. And it's caused the deaths of thousands of Ukrainians, the displacement of millions, and is accompanied by sexual violence and torture. The actions of the Russian military drove an 11 point decline in freedom for Ukrainians. The indicators associated with physical security and, mo and mobility were affected the most. Ukraine is rated partly free in our reports, and that's in contrast to Russia. Moscow's war led to a three point de score decline in Russia as the Kremlin targeted independent media and anti-war protesters. Russia's score is now a dismal 16 out of 100 firmly within the not free category. Russian occupiers in Ukraine have destroyed cultural sites, restricted the use of Ukrainian language in education, and transported abducted children to Russia en masse. This takes me to our second trend from this year, the growing repression of minorities. The number of countries and territories where forced ethnic change occurred increased from 19 to 21 over the past year. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, forced ethnic change can take many forms. It can be sudden and violent as in a war or more gradual over time. Regardless, its consequences can be devastating. The purpose is often to destroy a culture or to alter the, power, the balance of power in a territory. Another example of this is the conflict in Ethiopia where thousands of Tigrayans have been forced to flee their homes, they've suffered unlawful killings, sexual violence, and mass arbitrary attention. And another example that's been top of our minds for many years is China, where the government is deliberately altering the demographics of regions home to ethnic minorities. Throughout the year, Chinese authorities have imprisoned scores of Tibetan cultural, religious, and intellectual figures. And in the autonomous region of Xinjiang, the government has forced Uyghur children to attend boarding schools with Mandarin-only instruction. Over a million Uyghurs and other Muslims are detained in internment camps or forced labor camps. Surveillance is ubiquitous and highly invasive, severely restricting the freedom of local residents. Good news is often overlooked. And as I mentioned at the outset, this is a year that saw a narrow, balance between improvements and declines. I want to focus on several events that 20, from 2022 that highlighted the important progress made towards greater freedom. Colombia is, is a country that experienced the largest score decline of the year and moved from partly free to free status. The government gave temporary protection permits to more Venezuelan refugees and the constitutional court decriminalized abortion. Last year's presidential election was highly competitive and featured candidates from a diverse group of political parties, including the ultimate winner, Gustavo Petro. In Southern Africa, Lesotho also improved from partly free to, to free last year. And the country held free and fair parliamentary elections, which were won by a new opposition party. As we continue to look at some of the bright spots, this graphic shows a few of the many instances of democratic progress from the past year. One that I want to highlight here is Slovenia, which featured the second largest improvement in 2022. Last year's election had the highest voter turnout in 20 years and resulted in a new government that reversed many of the previous administration's policies, which had undermined political rights and civil liberties. It's important to note as an institution that while free and fair elections are key to improved freedom, they do not mark the finish line of democracy. Progress must be pushed through by civil society, independent courts, and elected representatives. 
In every region of the world, human rights defenders play a critical role in building democratic societies and expanding fundamental freedoms. And in 2022, these defenders were responsible for the passage of laws against sexual violence in defense of women's rights. They also exposed extrajudicial violence and corruption. Before we turn to the regional findings, let me say a few, mo a few things about the United States. The US is rated free in our report and its score remains stable in 2022 with gains in political pluralism and participation, offsetting losses in personal autonomy and individual rights. Thankfully, the 2022 midterm elections did not feature the same type of political violence and election denialism that we saw on the January 6th assault on the Capitol in the 2020 presidential elections. But losses occurred in people's personal autonomy after the Supreme Court nullified the longstanding constitutional right to abortion. At least 12 states have since imposed near total bans out of step with many other democracies and left a significant share of the population without access to the procedure. And as we look back across the decade plus, there are serious systemic issues that continue to challenge democracy in the United States. This includes worsening political polarization, as well as the unequal treatment for many minority groups. And the score decline, we think it's important to emphasize, has occurred during both Democratic and Republican administrations. The US's total score dropped 11 points from 2011 to 2022, and it now reaches 83 on our 100 point scale. Now I'll pass it over to Yana. Thanks Adrian and welcome everyone. We're very happy to be here sharing the results of this report with you. So I want to zoom out a little bit and take us around the world before I move on to the historical findings. So first we'll start with Africa where freedom slightly improved. A bright spot there was Kenya, which had an election that observers described as the most transparent ever. Freedom also improved slightly in Asia Pacific, although there, there was an exception in the Solomon Islands, which experienced the region's most serious decline after parliament arbitrarily postponed elections. In contrast to Africa and Asia Pacific, uh, freedom actually declined in the Americas. Nicaragua deteriorated the most. It had a four point decline because of the prosecution of political opposition figures and also attacks on the media which included uh, stopping CNN's broadcasts last year. Next slide. Moving on to Europe, Europe remained stable overall with six countries that improved and six countries that declined. However, the region also experienced uh, an, an array of elections that brought to power many uh, illiberal uh, political parties and leaders. Hungary actually exemplifies this trend. The country is among the five worst performers in Europe. And last April's parliamentary election featured systemic uh, manipulations that tilted the playing field in favor of Prime Minister Viktor Orban's party. In stark contrast to Europe, where most of the population live in free countries, the Middle East and Eurasia remain among the most repressive regions in the world. Only 3% of the population in those regions live in a free country. Israel is the only country that is rated free in the Middle East, but it's one to watch after the election of Prime Minister Netanyahu and an ultra-nationalist bloc uh, that came to power this past year. Their planned judicial reform may gravely undermine court's independence. In Eurasia, no country is rated free. I'll also note before I move on to our historical findings that Freedom in the World publishes narratives for all 210 countries and territories that we cover. And we do this on a rolling basis through the spring and summer. Around 50 are actually available on our website as of today. And uh, the countries I mentioned may be a good place to start if you'd like to dig in and look through those reports. So zooming out, as uh, Mike, Jane, and Adrian all mentioned, this is indeed our 50th anniversary. Freedom in the World was first published in 1973, and the world looked quite different back then. Military dictatorships dominated in Latin America, the Iron Curtain divided Europe, and there were dictators in place in much of Africa and Asia. When we first began issuing this comparative analysis, uh, just 44 of 148 countries were free. That is just shy of 30%. By 2000, 
By contrast, this past year, over 43% of countries were free. So that's 84 of 195. I think it's important also to note that when we started publishing this report, many of the countries we now think of as solid democracies were not democratic and unfree. So the first decade in which we, follow, we published this report, democracy came to Spain, Portugal, Greece, Botswana. In the next decade, it came to South Korea, South Africa, Taiwan, Argentina, and much of Eastern Europe. We saw then, as we see now in places like Colombia and Lesotho that Adrian spoke about, that free and fair elections remain the key in cementing democratic gains. Not only do democracies emerge from challenging environments, our data shows that they tend to endure. Once a country attains free status, it tends to remain there. By contrast, the total absence of freedom is actually quite rare in the world. So looking back on our 50 years of data, there's only 12 countries that exist today that have always been not free. So they've never left that category. And you see those countries in this slide. These are some of the most repressive countries in the world, but even there, there is uh, signs of hope. There, are, there is a demand for freedom. For example, in Cuba and China, which are two countries that have been not free for the entire last 50 years, there have been significant protests. And there were demonstrations in Cuba in July of 2021, which were the largest anti-government mobilization since, since the mid-1990s. People also took to the streets in this past year to protest against government mismanagement. China's extensive surveillance and censorship system is designed specifically to repress and discourage people from speaking out. And yet people continue to do just that. Freedom House's China Descent Monitor actually found that last year, China had over a thousand protests around the country. And of course, many of us witnessed the powerful wave of demonstrations that was in response to the government's zero COVID policies. Protests have also shaken Iran. In 2022, demonstrations lasted months and they spread to over a hundred cities following the death uh, of in police custody of Masa Amini. Hundreds of people were killed, arrested, or injured while speaking out for fundamental rights there. And at least four protester, protesters have been executed after trial. As a result of these developments, we declined uh, Iran's score by two points, and it now has only 12 out of 100. It's one of the worst performing countries in the world. But it's important to note that the protests that took place there last year were not the first protests uh, demanding further freedoms. Freedom House noted that Iranians, quote, strive for freedom all the way back in our 1980 edition. We noted protests again in 1999 when students at the University of Tehran uh, spoke out against the closure of a critical newspaper there. And we all remember that Iranians joined the Green Movement protests en masse in 2009. The point is that democratic progress is always possible because there is always a demand for fundamental freedoms, even in the most repressive environments. But this doesn't mean that progress is inevitable and people's natural desire for freedom deserves our active support. Looking at positive trends, we also tried to look at what were the most significant drivers of a historic democratic decline. And one of these key drivers, according to our historic data, is the deterioration of freedom of expression nothing has declined quite as much as freedom of expression in our data. This trend is extremely concerning because freedom of expression, both in relation to media and also to private expression, which is the ways we measure it, is a fundamental component of democracies. So to begin with media freedom, the number of countries and territories that now receive a score of zero out of four on this indicator has increased to 33, up from just 14 in 2005. So more than doubled. And it, this is much a, as much a historical problem as it is a problem today. And it's not just a problem in not free countries. For example, in Guatemala, which we rate as partly free, authorities arrested the director of a newspaper that was critical of the government last year. And several reporters fled the country after receiving credible threats. The crackdown also extends beyond journalists and the media. 
Our data evaluates the ability of ordinary people to express themselves, both online and offline. And today, 15 countries and territories score a zero out of four on this indicator of private expression, which is up from just six in 2005. So again, more than double. Governments employ many methods to create a culture of fear and self-censorship. For example, in Belarus, the authorities routinely threaten, harass, and arrest anyone who speaks out against the regime of Alexander Lukashenko. In Afghanistan, despite the very serious social and economic problems, the Taliban has invested heavily in a network of agents paid to inform on their neighbors' activities, and they routinely check people's phones in the streets to make sure that people aren't posting uh, critical remarks about the government online. All of these attacks matter, not because freedom of expression guarantees democracy, but because its absence protects and sustains authoritarianism. Let me conclude with a few words about our recommendations, which are based not only on the findings from this past year, but also on our historical, uh, historical analysis. First, as lessons from the last 50 years made clear, democracies must protect freedom of expression, both at home and abroad. This includes supporting public interest media, but it also includes offering help to journalists who are being forced to work from exile uh, through financial assistance and skills training. Second, again, returning to the issue of how important elections are for democracy, democracy should have reaffirmed the value of the democratic process. And this means swiftly denouncing coups and not congratulating the winners of fraudulent or rigged elections. Relatedly, Democracy should be clear and unapologetic about the virtues of the democratic process. That means addressing backsliding at home, but it also means prior prioritizing democracy and human rights in bilateral and international relationships. Democracies must also dramatically ramp up support for human rights defenders. These are the people really at the front line of defending fundamental rights, and they can't be left there by themselves. Democracy assistance must be sufficient in scale and provided in a sustainable way, especially in those countries and regions which are at critical junctures. One country that is top of mind for many listening today and is itself at a critical juncture is Ukraine. There, democratic governments must remain unwavering in their support, both now as the war goes on, but also in the future when Ukraine rebuilds. Let me just uh, finish by um, by saying that this, this event is not the end of our promotion of freedom in the world, and we will have a, a series of Twitter spaces coming up where you will get to hear from people from the regions and our own uh, program staff and other experts talk about regional trends and developments, and I hope people will tune in. Uh, the first one is planned for March 22nd. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yana and Adrian, for a great and concise uh, summary of uh, a lot of information. Uh, and now we have a really terrific panel to uh, to help us kind of dissect the findings and, and think about them. Uh, we have, first of all, Nuri Turkel, who's the chair of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom and the author of a very important book, no Escape, The True Story of China's Genocide of the Uyghurs. We're also honored to have uh, Leopoldo Lopez, a Venezuelan political leader, pro-democracy activist, and former prisoner of conscience, as well as Sakharov Prize laureate and co-founder of the World Liberty Congress. We'll also have Rachel Kleinfeld, uh, one of the top democracy experts uh, in the world, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace, and gratefully to us, Freedom House trustee. And we also have Alicia Phillips Mandeville, who is the Vice President of, De of the Department of Policy and Evaluation at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And I would just say, Alicia, we're very proud that the MCC uh, continues to use our data in your evaluation. That's really a source of great pride. I mention it all the time. So welcome to this great panel. Um, uh, and I'll, I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions, but I would also say that members of the audience can are welcome to submit your own questions uh, using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. And my, my team is going to be uh, monitoring the submissions and we'll try to get to as many questions, not just from me, 
in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. So first of all, let me just sort of pose a same question to each of members of this group, which is, uh, you know, I've been doing this report now for this, this event, some version of this event for seven years. Uh, we've been putting out this report for 50 years. Uh, as uh, as uh, Jana and Adrian indicated, uh, we've been through a period of what Larry Diamond has called a democracy recession, but really for the first time in the last seven years, certainly since I've been here, I, I do see some signs of hope. I don't want to be Pollyannish about it. There's a lot of bad stuff happening around the world, but I think this year's report was a little bit different than ones that, uh, that we've had in the past. So I'd, I'd really like to ask each of our panelists, and I'll start with Nuri, uh, do you agree with that? Do you see signs of hope in what's happening out there? So Mike, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. It's an honor to uh, share the virtual stage with my uh, esteemed colleagues. Um, I, I am very grateful to uh, Freedom House over the years supporting uh, the Uyghur human rights that are that are that is uh, near and dear to me, uh, as you know, Mike. Um, I feel um, I feel that we should be uh, hopeful. Um, I, there there are reasons to be hopeful. Um, I been somebody who's working in human rights uh, space in the last 20 years have gone through a lot of difficult times. So one of the most important thing that have been very helpful in my own case uh, to be uh, hopeful. So uh, after all, the, the arc of history tends toward justice. Um, and this uh, same draw of nature, uh, human spirit to such values means the struggle any of, in, of, in of itself is a sign of hope. We've seen this uh, as been mentioned today, uh, the white paper uh, protests in China last uh, late last year. Uh, brave woman defying the mandate of cover, mandate to cover in Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, protests, uh, even it's a smaller scale in Putin's Russia. Uh, like as we speak, uh, Georgian, uh, Georgian people taking to the streets to protest. Um, waving the flag of European Union uh, and the uh, flag of Ukraine. These are positive signs uh, that the human desire for uh, freedom means that the fight for democracy and human rights is not uh, a losing one. Uh, and this will continue to be a difficult challenge um, as the anger of authoritarian uh, figures around the world displaying, uh, 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 showing a full display. They seem to be a little bit more effective than the democratic world, but we need to remain hopeful. Thank you, Nuri. Leo, of, of anyone on, on, on this panel, you know, you personally have experienced uh, uh, the dark side of authoritarianism serving unjust sentence in, 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 in Venezuela for a number of years. Do you have hope? No, I certainly have a hope. Uh, I would like to start uh, also by thanking you, Freedom House, and, and all of the people that made this report and this conversation happen, because it's not just the report, it's a conversation around freedom. And, and I believe that this is uh, very, very important. And I commend that you continue to expand uh, what you're doing. So yes, I am hopeful. And uh, I believe that, as uh, Jane said at the beginning, the large majority of the world's population are hopeful too. They want to be free. They want to live in a democracy. They want their rights to be respected. And, and I believe that we are at a turning point in terms of the attention that freedom and democracy is getting. At the turn of the century, most of the attention went to the war on terrorism. And it's not like, uh, it's not that terrorism went away, but I believe that the invasion to Ukraine is putting spotlight to the confrontation between autocracy and democracy at a very crude level. And it's very evident that that's what's at stake. It's democracy and it's being assaulted by autocracy. So I, I think that that has gotten much more attention uh, worldwide as to the threat that, that autocracies are imposing globally uh, and also internally in, in functioning democracies. So yes, there, there are signs of, uh, of improvement, as you say. Uh, I believe that they might be fragile uh, in terms of making that, that pattern to continue to improve global democracy. But I am hopeful because the conversation is happening. I have seen that this uh, conversation of what to do to confront autocracy globally is, is very active, not just at Freedom House, but in many other places. And particularly, I am seeing the engagement of many activists and, and pro-democracy movements uh, coming together and thinking about 
you know, what are the, the global implications of this? And also the fact that we are facing a global problem. So in, in our case in Venezuela, yes, we are facing Maduro, but it's very evident to every Venezuela that we are also facing Putin, the mullahs from Iran, China, and Turkey as the main supporters of Maduro. So I am hopeful that we can bring this global struggle for freedom, uh, truly global, uh, without borders, and including not just the movements, the activists, the NGOs, the governments, but also the private sector to this, to, to this struggle for freedom. Thank you, Leo. Okay, Rachel, turning to you, I mean, this is your full-time job to look, analyze the health of democracy. Uh, and you've seen uh, some of our competition as well has been out recently. Uh, but tell us, uh, tell us how you tell us what your major takeaway from the report this year, and uh, uh, just tell us your, your major takeaway, please. Sure. I mean, I think I think Freedom House gets it quite right that this is a moment of hope. It might be an inflection point. I believe agency matters a lot, and so might is the operative word there. I mean, in 1942, there were only 12 countries that were free. Now we've only had 11 that have been unfree since the beginning of your report. Of those that were unfree, there's a huge courageous push for freedom in Iran. Those people need leaders to ensure that their courage has an endpoint that's a positive one. And I think I just want to emphasize here that one thing your report really brings out, democratic decline is really being driven by these bad leaders and a couple of countries geopolitically that are supporting those bad leaders. And democratic rebounds in South Korea and Moldova and Honduras is being driven by good leaders with courageous people behind them. And so there's real lessons here for those of us who care about democracy. We need to invest in leadership, political leadership and nonprofit leadership to hold their feet to the fire. We need to support them. We need to trumpet their stories to remind people it's possible. We also need to remember the, the geopolitics of this. I mean, Ukraine is downgraded. I understand why methodologically you have to downgrade it, but the country itself is fighting for its sovereignty. And that sovereignty has been conflated with democracy. And that is really good because it means that the people are not gonna let them go back. It's not gonna let the government um, return to some of the olden days, neither should the international donors, by the way, as we start paying for, um, for their uh, return as a country and their reconstruction. I see um, our MCC colleagues here will probably have something to say about that. But you know, as Ukraine is centralizing to fight this war, we can put money into decentralization in the reconstruction to make sure that they can hold on to these democratic gains that they've made, even though those numbers can't be reflected given the methodology in this report. So I think there's a lot of reason for hope. We need to get behind the good actors and we need to really recognize that Ukraine gives us a moment to change the geopolitics of this situation. And I think we are as a world making the best use of that. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Alicia, uh, I would I would be interested in your general take too on the report, but also your your agency is a consumer of the report, and I'm wondering if in, if in your comments you could also address a little bit about how how much the donor community, you know, governments, foundations, and others ought to be prioritizing these kinds of uh, results in their in their decisions. I think that's something that we've been trying to push for at Freedom House, but I'm curious your perspective on that. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'm, I'm uh, genuinely excited to be here. We are a consumer of the, the Freedom House, Freedom of the World data. Um, you know, when you ask the question about uh, should we have hope, in some ways, we, we don't have an option. MPC always has to have hope <laughs> that is going to, that the improvements are going to be findable. Um, you know, uh, for folks uh, not familiar with MCC, we rely really directly on the Freedom of the World data set to identify the countries that we can work in. Our partner countries all meet a specific level of criteria on the data. Um, and it means we have a lot of conversations with them about political rights and civil liberties and why, why they are or are not meeting criteria. Um, and as a result, kind of the the, both the resilience and the fragility of democracy is incredibly real to us. Um, you know, Burkina Faso was a partner for MCC. They're the single largest drop this year in the report. Um, we've got partners on the large upside though as well, Kosovo, Kenya, Lesotho. So the, the reality of um, both breakthroughs in positive and negative ways, and then the slow grind of improvement or the slow grind of deterioration, both of those, all of those, all four of those are things that I think we um, pay very close attention to. As a result, though, it means we're having a lot of good conversations about what is the role of an economic actor to look at this. MCC is an economic development agency. All of our assistance is focused on economic investments and growth and poverty reduction. Um, 
but by using uh, these kinds of measures, by looking at the state of democracy, the rights of individual citizens, the nature, <clears throat> pardon me, of institutions in a country, that tells us a lot about what we'll actually be able to accomplish economically. And I think for us, that's a big piece of where this conversation um, is, I think, exciting going forward, not just how can we measure and how can we assess which which partners are meeting a particular democratic criteria, um, but also how do we think about the way that we work with them so that you can actually help democracy to deliver. Um, I think places like Burkina really show us how much that matters. The delivery of, of a, a basic function for citizens is a big piece of uh, what we all want to make sure is in place to sustain some of, to sustain progress when it happens. Good. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I'm already seeing in the in the Q&A, a lot of really good questions, and I promise we're going to try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Let me just ask one or two more questions. I do think that we sometimes lose sight uh, in all the different countries of how important a factor China is uh, in the global decline of freedom. Uh, I, will, I always often point out that you know China under Xi Jinping has become even more internally repressive than it was, which is Quite, quite something since when President Xi took office, uh, China scored 17 on a global scale of zero to 100, now it's down to nine. And as if also one of the recurrent themes of our reports has been China's uh, growing uh, intervention abroad on, in different ways uh, on, on behalf of authoritarianism. You know, uh, Leo made the point about uh, Venezuela and uh, other countries. So I'd, I'd like to start with Nuri just on the role of China. And uh, do you think, uh, how, how do you see China factoring into the global story of freedom right now? Not just what's happening in China, but around the world. It, it's not uh, exaggeration to say uh, China is uh, in the top of the threat to global freedom. Um, a number of for, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, we can, for the for the for the time being, we can just not to worry too much about the geopolitical aspect. But the the type of tools that they developed, uh, the messaging that they developed, the influence that they have uh, at their disposal, has been very very anti democratic. Um, you know, we rightfully talk about Russia and, and Ukraine, but elephant in the room is China. Uh, China is, um, as some of our colleagues mentioned, uh, developed some of the most sophisticated forms of uh, surveillance techniques that have been uh, metastasizing. Uh, Secretary Blinken noted last year in his China speech that there are 80 countries, including some of the democratic nations, have uh, adopted uh, Chinese surveillance techniques. So that is, you know, some of those techniques, Chinese development in science technology field is not a, has not been a moral uh, one. Uh, they use technology for suppressing freedom uh, that has been tested and, 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 and proven to be effective. Uh, in case in point, the COVID lockdown, every moment of the Chinese citizens were monitored. And now uh, companies like ZTE even developed uh, uh, motion detector cameras that are gaining ground in some uh, countries ruled by authoritarian figures. Uh, in Africa, for example, uh, Huawei providing uh, technical assistance to um, authoritarian figures who are fearful of the opposition voices. And also the China has been uh, manipulating and misusing its global influence in international organizations such as the UN, Interpol, uh, they're using Interpol to harass uh, political dissidents around the world. They're using uh, UN Human Rights Council to, to silence uh, uh, critical voices uh, among the uh, democratic nations. Uh, last year, the United States led uh, Western democracies could not even secure 19 votes to debate on uh, Michelle Bachelet's report on Xinjiang. So um, the economic coercion, that has also been uh, one of the most uh, effective tools Chinese have displayed. So uh, you know, they have not uh, publicly uh, promoting their own uh, form of governance or Chinese style, gov style governance, but they have been quietly propping up uh, dictators, authoritarian figures around the world. Uh, you know, as former Secretary of State uh, rightly noted, 
that China has its own League of Nations when it comes to human rights abuses. Thank you, Nuri. Leo, I'd like, if I may, to focus your attention on, on, on a different part of the world, which is uh, uh, Latin America. And uh, as Yana said, you know, there's been erosion in, in freedom and democracy uh, considerable in some countries in Latin America, including your own, but also Nicaragua. Obviously, Cuba has always been a problem for a long time. Uh, a number of other countries. Um, I think in a, in a different era, this might have been a big story in Washington, but because of Ukraine and because of other factors, uh, maybe not so much. But do you think you could just tell us a little bit about from a from a human rights and democracy perspective, what is happening in the, in the region and, and, and what do we need to do about it? Well, what, what has happened in the region over the past uh, over, over the past years is that we've seen um, three countries become clearly autocratic. And I include a fourth because of the political prisoners that they have, which is Bolivia. And they've become really a center to expand uh, a, a way of eroding democracy from within. So the experience of Venezuela, it's, it's a clear example of how a democratic country eroded uh, until it became clearly an autocratic country. It took many years, actually. Chavez was elected in the year 1999, and it all began with the change of the constitution through a national constituent assembly, which has been a recipe that has been tried elsewhere in the continent. Uh, they packed the institutions, changed the constitution, changed the people that were running the institutions to have cronies and people that were following political orders and not the rule of law in order to erode democracy. But the process took many years. It was not until 2014 when we called for protests, that's when I was taken to prison, that the perception of Venezuelans inside our country uh, shifted from um, thinking of Venezuela as a democracy in decay to clearly a dictatorship. And also, of course, the international perspective. So now we have Venezuela, we have Cuba as the two main exporters of this uh, model of manipulating democratic institutions, the rule of law, uh, and of course, repression tools and, and human rights in order to hold on to power. And we have seen this influence to other countries in, in Latin America that are, are today not seen as clearly autocratic, but are uh, in facing the danger of becoming more and more autocratic. So uh, I think the continent is at risk. I think the continent is at a point where the true uh, principles of democracy uh, could be um, taken to assault. Um, we have seen attacks on the free expression, and this is not just attacks on the freedom of expression of the media, but also of individuals. Um, I myself was sentenced to 14 years in prison because of the speeches I was giving to the Venezuelan people. Uh, and that's just one example of how freedom of speech has been eroded. Um, so I think that uh, Latin America is at risk. Latin America uh, has the huge challenge in terms of democracy to provide to the large majority of the population solutions. Because we can talk about freedom, democracy, human rights, free and fair elections, the rule of law. But the best way to defend democracy is when a democracy provides solutions to the people, solutions to the people from a democratic system. So that's a, that's a real challenge. So I, I think that um, we need to understand that Latin America is at risk, it's under threat. Uh, and also we need to know the increasing influence of China and Russia and also Iran and Turkey on Latin America. This was unheard of and unthinkable 20, 25 years ago. But today, the largest trade um, partner of Latin America is China. Um, there is military influence in many countries of Latin America from Russia. Uh, the kleptocratic network, um, where Russia provides a, a lot of infrastructure, it's spreading out all throughout Latin America. Um, different governments are using the manipulation of media uh, in order to manipulate public opinion. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, at risk. I, I would not say that today we can talk about a healthy, strong, democratic continent. And, and that is actually uh, one of the challenges of the OAS uh, to really hold true to its founding documents and to the Charter of Democracy that was signed on September 11 of 2001 uh, to defend democracy and to have the Western Hemisphere as the hemisphere of democracy. Today, unfortunately, that is not the case, but I think that should be the challenge and 
um, the objective that we should look for. Thank you, Leo. Rachel, I want to turn with you to a different country, which is our own, the United States. Uh, you know, Freedom House uh, has always included a chapter in our report about the United States, which I think is something I'm very proud of. Uh, we try to hold the United States to the same set of indicators that we look at any country. And uh, obviously, for a variety of reasons, there's been more attention to our country uh, uh, in the last uh five or six years, although as uh, Yana and Adrian indicated in the report, you know, U.S. democracy, according to Freedom House data, has been weakening a bit, uh, has been weakening, well, weakening significantly over the last uh, uh, 10, or 10, 10 or 12 years. So I guess, and what's interesting too to me is that you as a scholar have kind of moved from, from, from studying international democracy more to, to democracy here at home. So I'm just kind of curious, uh, what you think are the most urgent issues uh, to address uh, in terms of strengthening American democracy? And I would also really be interested in like looking at it from a, you know, as you always do, from a, from a nonpartisan point of view. Like what, what, are, what are things that we need to worry about, whether we're Republican, Democrat, independent, or whatever? Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the reasons that I've switched my career from being largely global to focusing more on the United States is because you cannot have global democracy if the United States is not a very strong player in that field. Madeleine Albright said that U.S. is the indispensable nation. It's absolutely true. Democracy is mostly a domestic issue in every country. It's domestic issues that drive the fall of it. Domestic politics matter most. But the U.S. puts a big thumb on the scale. You know, when Brazil had its recent coup, the U.S. is deeply engaged with the Brazilian military. Would the Brazilian military have done what it did in standing back without that U.S. engagement? I don't know. I'm glad I didn't have to find out. Were the quarterback, were the convener, were the cajoler, were able to bring a lot of diplomatic weight to the democracy table, financial tools as the reserve currency, and then, of course, we're a major funder of democracy promotion. Other countries do a lot. You know, Italy goes to democracy, but no one does as much as the United States. And so it really matters that we stay behind uh, global democracy. And on that, as you said, it's absolutely important that this is a bipartisan issue. We are really a nation poised on a knife point and things can change at, at any moment really, not since reconstruction have we had a system where the whole system can change with basically every election, Cong congressional power can change. So we needed both sides to agree on democracy. And for years we had that under President Trump, when he tried to cut democracy funding, it was Republicans in Congress that plussed it up hugely, um, actually. Um, but uh, geopolitics still mattered. You know, Fox just revealed that there was a segment that they had where Trump said he would have let Putin take a chunk of, of Ukraine, um, and they cut that segment. That's not good. Uh, there's only so much that congressional Republicans can do. So in terms of what we should do, the decline is asymmetric. You just can't get away from that. Democrats really need to end their illiberal cancel culture. It's eating their movement from inside and it will eventually have major repercussions. But most of the work is needed on the Republican side. Lots and lots of Republicans really care about democracy and they deserve the rebuilding of a pro-democracy conservative party again. So people who are fiscally or socially conservative don't have to choose between those values and supporting democracy. But thanks to real manipulation of public opinion that we're now seeing in the court documents about Fox News and so on, Republicans now have a base where fewer than 50% believe we should be supporting Ukraine. That's because of these venal talking heads who know the truth and aren't giving them the truth. Russia's funding secessionist movements in California and Texas and so on. That, that's eating us away from inside. So we really need a lot of conservative entities, businesses, voters, the media, to say democracy and the rule of law matters. It matters to us business. It matters to our way of life. We're not gonna let that go. This is gonna be a conservative issue. We need those institutional reforms like ranked cho choice voting, final five, fusion. So Republican voters can vote for Republicans who have these um, beliefs and, and they don't have to give up their conservative bona fides. And that'll let us have a more functional Congress where um, in turn, our government can move a little less from its executive heavy uh, area right now, which is not good for U.S. democracy to be so presidentially focused itself. So I think um, if progressives can can give enough space, the Republicans can do the work, um, but work needs to be done. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm, I'm I want I want there's I'm looking at the question. There's a good question here from Michael Koenig. Uh, I hope I pronounced the name right. 
about how some of the recommendations about what to do about this from Freedom House, he says, are kind of reactive. And are there recommendations for more proactive measures uh, that we ought to be taking to, uh, you know, help, you know, trigger a, a new democratic wave, if you will? Uh, I, I'm sort of reformulating the question a little bit. So I want, I want each of the panelists to be thinking of that question. I do want to ask Alicia, if I may, if it's okay with you, I want to ask you about Africa. Because one of the, that's a, that's a part of the world uh, where obviously MCC uh, focuses uh, extensively. I was struck uh, by the numbers uh, when you when you look at this question from the point of view of regionally, that only 7% of people on the continent live in what is considered a free country. And I'm, I'm kind of curious if you might, number one, address, you know, you know, what you see as the broader trends within Africa. And, and number two, um, what, what kind of strategies do you think, and this gets to the question, that you th do you think that democracy advocates and others need to be taking to help, uh, uh, to help support and nurture democracy uh, uh, in Africa? No, thank you. Um, and I actually think the answer to this in some ways ties back actually to the question you were just reframing. So maybe I'll I'll answer this and segue us to the other piece. Yeah, and I'll reframe it for the others, but, but you go first, Alicia. No, I, and um, you know, to I think the the framing that only seven percent live in countries that are free. This is in the full fully free purple category of, of yeah, freedom yeah. house mapping, right? Um, and MCC's criteria actually includes lots of partners that are in the partly free category. And I think that is part of the answer to this question, which is um, around what we understand as the way it is possible to make progress on democratic rights and institutions. Because I think there is a deep desire to have kind of breakthrough moments and that those are the ways that progress obtains and that um, it's linear. And once you have a breakthrough moment, then, then we'll see more. And what we have found over almost 20 years now of operating is that is, that is just not the way democratic institutions evolve over time. Um, and so part of what our finding has been is that working with country partners that have, have demonstrated there is a commitment to be on, on a democratic path, whether that is individual rights or that is the institutions that protect them and that, that maintain a, a systematic governance. Working with them and meeting them where they are on what is next, where is the space for growth? What is it that activists are pressing on that they, there is growth potential in? Whether that is more rights for individuals around dissent or assembly or even academic free speech, whether that is more about kind of participation in different institutions. We have extremely different conversations with different partners, um, but it does come back to kind of meeting, uh, meeting the reality of each country's situate dem democratic situation as opposed to kind of a, a, a preformed notion of what that might include. Um, and so I think, you know, from MCC, and then so tying actually this segue like to, I think the question that the um, person in the audience asked around, you know, what's proactive. I, one of the things that I thought uh, really struck me in the presentation from the Freedom House folks earlier was this notion of being clear and unapologetic about support for democracy and democratic institutions. And, um, you know, for us, that's just part of our DNA. We're really clear about it. It's on the scorecard. We talk about it all the time. It's part of the criteria for which countries we can work with. We're also really unapologetic about that. <laughs> um, people know that we select democracy. And when we start working with a country, we're really clear that we expect continued focus on democracy. So the select and expect piece are really clear. I think that when we talk about what is proactive, there's a third one, and that is a respect piece. So if we're selecting for countries that are committed to a democratic path, and we are clear with them from our side, that that's our expectation that that path continues in a forward direction and not lots of backtracking. Um, there needs to be also a, a respect in our engagement around what does it mean for that democracy to deliver for its population? And, and how, does, how does its economic delivery and its governance delivery fit up against the democratic delivery of rights and, and protections? And that's a newer part of a conversation, but I do think it's a really healthy um, way to think about what's proactive, but stays actually really cleanly inside those recommendations about being clear and unapologetic. Thank you. Uh, in the spirit of that answer, I, I wanna ask the other three panelists. I think what, what the gentleman was trying to get at in the question is like, we've been sort of spending about half an hour or so kind of diagnosing the problem and analyzing it. But I'd like to, I'd like the three of you or the four of you, and, and at least if you have other ideas too, please, we can share them. But I'd like to know, what are the one or two concrete things that you think democracies, governments need to do 
to uh, helpfully, hopefully nurture this hope that we're seeing this year in this year's report and turn it into really a significant trend of, 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 of strengthening democracy and, and really uh, hopefully waning authoritarian practice. Uh, Nuri, Leo, and Rachel, what would you say? Like, this is one or two things that you would emphasize. Well, I, I, I like to, I like to, uh, uh, you know, I need to be a little bit more critical of our government. Um, you know, the messaging is, is so uh, confusing. The, the, the high level officials, like the senior officials in our, in our government, for example, when we talk about democracy, human rights, and freedom, we cannot be uh, wishy washy. We have to be very, very clear in our messaging. Um, for example, human rights abuses, mistreatment is not, are not the same thing as genocide or human, uh, crimes against humanity. So there's a serious uh, messaging problem that we need to address. I, I wholeheartedly agree that uh, we have to be more on focusing on defense as well as, as an offense uh, when we talk about freedom issues. That's one. Number two, um, we have to also understand, you know, in, in, the, in the area that I, I, I've been immersed in, in, in the case of China, we have to pay attention to what they say. Uh, for example, when uh, Xi Jinping just told the delegates around this two meeting uh, this Monday, Western countries led by the United States are implementing all around containment, encirclement, and suppression against us. That encirclement is about free, uh, freedom ideas, uh, freedom, press freedom, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. So we have to elevate our way of treating freedom issues, democracy, issues, human rights issues in the same level, at least the way that regimes like the one in Beijing sees it. And finally, we need to blast, blast a hole in digital iron curtain. Um, last year in the speech that I mentioned earlier, uh, 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 Blinken's China speech, were not allowed to be heard or read by the Chinese citizens. It's, it's almost an aqua speech the messaging, uh, the good messages, good information are not reaching to people who are yearning for freedom. So we have to we have to find a way to deliver good messages, accurate information. Today's world, ByteDance, uh, ByteDance, and now TikTok controls messaging uh, specifically to uh, uh, that uh, that goes to the younger generation. Thank you, uh, Leo. What 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 do you, what is your uh you know, one or two top line recommendations of what you'd like to see uh, the leading the leading democracies, United Nations, what would you like to see policymakers do to, 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 to advance freedom? Well, in, in, in the spirit of your introduction and of the report that it talks about the possibility of a turning point, I think that uh, we are uh, at, at that possibility. Um, and I think we need to kind of take back, you know, 30 years. What was the conversation after the fall of the Berlin Wall? Uh, there was a conviction that free market economy was going to trump uh, the possibility to open for a trickle down democracy. So that led to globalization that led to, you know, this, this uh, expansion of market economy that 30 years uh, in, in hindsight, it tells us that it's not necessarily true that market economy is going to bring about more democracy. And in the meantime, I believe that most of the support coming from the US, Europe, and other countries willing to support uh, democracy struggles in closed societies was focused in civil society uh, and mostly in initiatives that were non political, uh, defending you know, or promoting development issues that are very important but are not at the core of the struggle to promote uh, the transition towards democracy. So a first recommendation that I think we, we should think about is uh, to think about also freedom society, not just civil society, because the people who are willing to take the streets, who are willing to organize movements, uh, to risk their lives, their freedom for democracy are different individuals, are different movements. And I think these movements require support. I have heard from many activists from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, very prominent, good leaders that have been getting support for some initiatives that they have in their NGOs, that once they become a strong voice challenging the autocrats, that funding gets taken away from them because, quote unquote, they become too political. So I think that this idea of supporting uh, freedom society movements and, the, and individuals is very important. Uh, two, I believe it's part of your recommendations that enabling autocrats in, in all of their webs that they, that they create 
is something that is very critical. Uh, I agree with Nuri that sometimes the messaging is confusing. Sometimes the messaging is more about uh, energy in the case of Venezuela or migration in the case of uh, Latin America than about democracy. And I think that that commitment uh, of the United States and Europe to democracy needs to be a priority. And there are tools and these tools, I believe that need to be sharpened, need to be um, um, thought out uh, to become more, more effective, uh, like the sanctions. I believe that sanctions work, but I believe that the discussion should not be whether to impose or to take away sanctions. I think that the discussion should be focused in how to make sanctions more effective, who to sanction, who are the enablers, not necessarily the people who are in government positions. These are, you know, the, uh, the, a network of uh, kleptocrats that are uh, taking away the resources and the possibilities and through corruption schemes, the possibilities of hope for the people in their countries. So I think um, the most important thing is to go on the offensive and the offensive from within and the offensive from within are the people. And, and we have seen that in Iran. Who would have thought six months ago that Iran was going to go through a process of months and months of protests um, that are really protests for freedom or in China or, or now we're seeing them in Georgia. Uh, and what's really interesting about what's happening in all of these protests is that they are sparked for different reasons. For the hijab in the case of Iran, for a change of a law in the case of Nicaragua or Venezuela. Um, but then they all converge uh, to the same calling, to the same uh, petition. Respect for human rights and free and fair elections. So it's very clear that people want freedom. And at the end, you know, there might be particular circumstances but the convergence towards the commitment to, to freedom and democratization is there. So if we believe that there is a possibility of a fourth wave of democratization, it's not going to happen spontaneously. Freedom is not free. Freedom is not going to come without fighting for it. And I believe that it needs to be strategic uh, in the best interest of the United States of Europe to promote freedom all over the world because that will provide a more secure environment for the places where there are democracies. An inch lost to autocracy outside the United States or for Europe is an inch closer to autocracy inside the United States and Europe. Thank you, Leo. Uh, Rachel, I wanna sort of ask you about the what to do question, but just in the spirit of kind of getting a little bit more audience participation, there are a lot of questions here and my, and my colleagues are gonna to try to also we're not going to get to all of them, but we'll try to answer as many as we can also in the chat itself. But there's a question here, which I think is relevant to the topic from uh, Mark Cassell, which is, uh, what do we think is the right approach to encouraging change in authoritarian countries? Should we isolate undemocratic countries through sanctions a la Cuba, or should we engage economically with undemocratic countries in the hope that economic prosperity leads to political freedom, which has been basically the, the course with China over the last 20 years? What did you, do you have? I mean, do you have any thoughts in general about that framing? Uh, and 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 you're also welcome to add in the one or two Kleinfeld recommendations if you want to. <laughs> sure, I'll throw in some um, some proactive Kleinfeld recommendations. I think that the way we've thought about this as isolate or engage is just too broad. Democracy is domestic. Politics is domestic. You need to look at every single country and look at what is the theory of change. How do you get that strategic change? What do we need to do to drive it? In some countries, um, isolation is just not going to work. We've seen that with Cuba, for instance, years and years and years of isolation. That was not the right path. Um, with China, engagement clearly did not work very well um, and, and has left us really, really dependent in a quite dangerous way. And so I think it's just too binary and it really needs to be taken case by case. One of my proactive recommendations, actually, which, uh, which applies to this, is that we need to rethink the relationship between democracy and the economy. Leo was just saying that we had this erroneous idea in the 90s, and it was really erroneous. What happened was this privatization that we went through, thinking we were bringing about capitalism, brought oligarchy to a lot of countries. Oligarchy is deeply inimical to democracy, but the way that the privatizations were done um, meant that that's what you got. And then you have concentrations of economic power, which destroys your, try your attempt to have competition in the political realm. So 
when we're thinking about engaging these other countries, we need to really think about what is an economy that works for democracy? That's a decentralized economy with real economic competition. It's a it's a, what Jefferson talked about when he talked about the democracy economy in America. You know, our founding fathers talked about this, Aristotle talked about this, um, but we haven't thought about it for a long time. And we really need to because the 90s was not the right model and it took some learning. I think another piece of learning that we've had, which, which touches on this isolator engage is we need to reduce dependence in strategic areas. I used to be a real free trader, I'm still a free trader, but we can't be so tied to these countries that we can't act. And by we, I mean all the democratic countries. So Europe is doing this with Russian oil, getting itself uh, extricated. Biden is doing this with China. This is important. I'm not saying we should become um, a, a series of separate economic spaces, but we need to think about how our economic ties are making it hard to act in the democracy support realm. Um, and then I'll say just one more thing about proactive engagement. It is the time to make the case for democracy and drive that case home. And it can't be the case from the 1990s. I mean, I was a child of the 90s. I listened to you too. I was inspired by all the language of that era. We're not in that era. Young people now are pretty indifferent to um, democracy in an awful lot of countries. Young people, I know Freedom House is doing some really excellent new work in this sphere. They need to understand that climate, minority rights, social justice, all these things they care about are inextricably tied to democracy. And even though democracy needs a lot of work on all those areas, it's no, no comparison with the Uyghurs in China or with queer rights in Russia um, or women's rights in Iran. And then we need to drive the case home to all the countries on the sidelines. Now, some of those countries are bought by China. Um, some of those countries have their militaries basically bought and supported by Russia. So it's not a free and equal playing field. But we need to make the case that Ukraine is a colonized country. That's a yeah, that's a colonial war that's being fought there. And people who are anti-colonial should recognize that white countries were colonized as well. We need to think about how do we get people who um, see the, the problems with the democracies in our countries to nevertheless see that the democracy fight is also their fight and um, come up with a new way of talking about it to, to make that strong narrative argument to them. Because now is a moment with COVID in China, with Russia and Ukraine, where we could really regain the narrative battle if we tried hard. You know, there's a Mike, if I may, uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Alicia. No, go ahead, yeah. Alicia. May, I, may I just plus one to many of the things that Rachel has said, um, including one, just the the a shout out for including both Aristotle and you two in a single response, which I don't think I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I think this, uh, you know, the question engage, don't engage. So U U.S. federal agency, we worked in Burkina Faso until that coup. We're not engaged anymore. We no longer work there. We, we Our policy is you, you cannot work in a country that is no longer su sufficiently democratic. Two coups counts. So they're not our partners anymore. We have disengaged. I can no longer do anything that supports democratic progress in Burkina Faso. Um, so I think the, the question that we are wrestling with that Rachel has just called out is where we can engage, where there are decisions on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, annual basis that country governments are making about the way democracy will or won't progress. How do you line up the conversation and the incentive structure around the progress towards more democracy and not away from it? Um, and I do think the economic piece is a big piece of that. You cannot buy democracy. <laughs> Freedom may not be free, but you also can't buy democracy. Um, but you can talk about the very real interaction between what kind of economy a country creates for its population and what kind of government a country creates that, that serves its population. And those things, a conversation that recognizes the relationship between those things, this is a piece where I think both the economic side and the governance side shy away from that intersection sometimes. Um, we find ourselves right in the middle of it. And so I'm enthusiastic to have more of those kinds of conversations looking ahead. Hey, thank you, Alicia. Leo, you look like you want to get involved here. Yeah. Let, let me, you, you, please say what you want, but I'd like you to consider one other question in your answer, because there's a good question in the group, which is about pointing out that there are these new mass movements around the world, uh, you know, and Iran is like the biggest example where there appear to be leaderless, leaderless you know, either by design or because uh, of repression. And, uh, you know, what can the international community, including the United States, do to leverage these movements for democratic change? I think that's a, I think it's a very interesting question. One we're thinking a lot, a lot about at Freedom House that the traditional 
democracy advocates are changing a little bit and, 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 and these new kinds of groups need to be supported. So say what you wanted to say, but also if you could also address that issue, because I think you might have something interesting to say on that since you work with a lot of activists. Oh, it's uh, actually they're related. Uh, my comment was that one thing is to engage uh, with the government, uh, with whoever's having the formal power, and a very different one, and I think that's a big challenge, is how to engage with the people. So more than half of the world's population is living in, in, in uh, countries that you shouldn't engage with, uh, but the people from those countries want freedom. So there must be ways to engage with the people through freedom and pro-democracy movements, civil society initiatives, that will provide the tools, the support, the connections, also the confidence to continue the struggle for freedom. The people in Iran want to be free. It's evident from the protests. I believe the people in China want to be free if they would be able to express themselves freely. The people in, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Cuba, in Zimbabwe, in Hong Kong. So it, it, it's, it's very often to confuse the regime, the, the structure that's in power with the population. And uh, one of the findings uh, of this report all throughout the 50 years is that people want to be free. And, and, and that um, seems to be an increasing sentiment so uh, how to support these movements is it's your, your question. Well, that's my idea of rethinking, only focusing in civil society to also focus in freedom society. And I, I, I think of freedom society as these type of individuals and movements that are willing to organize civil resistance, nonviolent action, promote free and fair elections, and willing to take the risk. And uh, it's very important that people express themselves uh, through the channels of communication, but also through protests and when having the opportunity through the votes. But it's always an issue of numbers. We always need to see how to impact the largest number of people within close societies so they can express themselves. So I, I believe that there needs to be a lot of thought put into what are the things that can be done to support these movements internally. Uh, we have many recommendations. That's what we've been doing with the uh, World Liberty Congress. And that's what we are getting together. But just to give you an example, one of the, the, the obstacles that these regimes impose on NGOs, movements, is the financial restrictions to get resources into these countries. Well, today there are alternatives to this. Uh, you can use, as we did in Venezuela, to provide support for medical doctors and nurses in 2020 during COVID. We used a stable coin to provide direct uh, support to medical doctors and nurses uh, actually with the support of a license from uh, Treasury and OFAC that provided direct support without going directly to the financial system of uh, dictatorship of Maduro. So I think that the, 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 the thinking, the conversation should focus at this part of it, how to strengthen these pro-democracy and freedom movements and understand that these are movements many times different in the types of people, in their mission, than your traditional civil society uh, initiatives that I believe should continue to receive support, but also that there should be an increase in support to pro-democracy movements. And with the, with the, with the mention of uh, Iran, it's very interesting. Yes, it was, it has been a leaderless protest, and I think that has been very interesting, but it's also very interesting to see how over the past weeks, the Iranian opposition, many of them in exile, that were completely um, disjointed and, and had absolutely no coordination, they are coming together uh, because of the protests. So now we are seeing at least a reference in Iran uh, of a coalition of pro-democracy leaderships and movements that can take the challenge to the, to the regime in Iran to a next level because they are also thinking not only of the day before, to, to promote the transition to democracy, but also thinking a very important issue the day after. What to do when democracy happens so you don't have setbacks? Because we have also seen in many countries, in Tunisia, in, uh, in Egypt, uh, in Bolivia, we have seen some increases towards democracy, but there were setbacks actually really, really fast. So the thinking uh, about the day after in terms of institution building, in terms of providing people answers, and of course, in terms of uh, economic prosperity should also be a priority. Thanks, Leo. Uh, all right, listen, we have four minutes left, so I'm gonna make a command decision. I would like to give each of our panelists one minute for any concluding comments or reactions. I mean, we, we can't, we've only scratched the surface. It's been a great conversation. All of you have been just terrific. 
in your uh, in your erudition and uh, ex explanatory powers, but we're sort of out of time. So I'm going to give Nuri, everyone, please try to limit one minute about any just final conclusions. Go ahead, Nuri. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, I wanted to point out um, in response to some of the points that are being made uh, on the engagement, um, the engagement policy, um, uh, specifically with China, as Rachel pointed out, did not work. Instead of democratizing uh, uh, or freeing the Chinese people, uh, the Chinese uh, regime, uh, Chinese Communist Party is changing our way of life and look at uh, various issues that uh, that need to be recognized. This is not a political issue. This is not a geopolitical issue. This is a very, very uh, a, a simple matter that needs a recognition across the board. The other uh, issue um, that also been part of the discussion lately is that we need a authoritarian regime like the one in Beijing on climate crisis. But we have to understand that climate environmental issues, um, uh, specifically a, 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 a Chinese government now committing an act of genocide, cannot, we cannot say in a good conscience that they really care about the environment. Not only that, on a policy level, it's not something that, are a prior, that is a priority to the Chinese state. Therefore, in the last, uh, 10, 15 years, despite how hard the United States and others are trying, even at the cost of human rights and freedom, the Chinese did not get on board. Uh, they still approving coal powered power stations. Uh, and there's no way to even verify uh, the Chinese leaders' commitment to the international community. And also the other thing that we have to, uh, we have to talk about this is very uncomfortable topic is that Americans need to stop investing in self-destruction the Chinese uh, entities specifically. We know now that the Chinese Military Medical Academy and its 11 affiliates as uh, added into the entity list in December, 2021, developed brain control weaponry to be used against ethno-religious groups. This is the regime that the American people are uh, continuing to invest. So we have to, we have to be very honest in our approach and practical, and we need to learn how the Chinese system works. There are a lot of China experts these days out in public discussing writing, but they're missing the fundamental point that is China has been in constant battle against freedom. They use it use the terms such as Western influence. And thank, today thank they use something called Western encirclement. So that's my, uh, that's my uh, uh, comment um, as we conclude this important event. Okay, thank you, Nuri. Rachel. So when I was little, I used to imagine what would happen if I lived in a place or a time where ordinary people had to make extraordinary decisions, such as Leo has lived in. And you don't want that. Most of us um, are lucky to be in parts of the world where we don't have to make that kind of heroic decision. We don't have to be heroes to be good people. But in some parts of the world, you do have to be a hero. And we need to all get better at using those muscles. That's the virtue ethics of getting better at using courageous muscles, including in America, where there's been a lot of propaganda, a lot of lies, a lot of people allowing that to move forward because we're not used to being heroic. We all need to be a little more courageous standing up for democracy in our own countries and in other countries. And we should all care because you know, America's a world, what, 350 million people in America, uh, Venezuela adds a couple, uh, tens of millions. The world is 8 billion people. The odds are that they're amazing inventors, entrepreneurs, and so on in many other countries that we're not benefiting from. The COVID vaccines were developed by Turkish, German, Austrian, British, American scientists, all democracies. The Russian vaccine actually turned out to be good, but no one trusted it. And the Chinese vaccine did not turn out to be good democracy is willing to share can spur a lot of innovation that helps the whole world. This is not going to be the last pandemic in our lifetimes, I worry. Um, we need more democracy. All of us need more democracy around the world because it benefits all of us. And we all need to get a little better at using those courage muscles to stand up to a lack of democracy or a lack of honesty in our own systems and um, to do the right thing in others so that we can build a world that we'll all be safer in. Thank you, Rachel. Alicia. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think my one request would be to leave space and attention for the partly free spaces. Um, a lot of our conversations in this space uh, focus on the most egregious actors or the best performing actors. Um, and I think that the opportunities to prevent backsliding when it's 
one step, there's a frog boiling problem, right? The frog doesn't know it's being boiled until it's too late. <laughs> there's, there's potential to turn the heat down a little before the boiling point hits. And I think some of those conversations still require uh, courageousness because they're uncomfortable. Um, but I think preserving space and attention both to work, to talk through how to turn the heat down on back, how to stop backsliding before it locks in. Um, and then also to celebrate incremental progress because that's hard. Um, and I, I will say that, um, you know, the, some of the things reflected about changes in the United States make the conversation with other countries different because you can honestly say, I get it, this is hard. <laughs> there are some things that are fragile about this. It is hard, that's why we're gonna talk about it. That's why we're in it together. Um, and I, th that conversation is not dramatic. <clears throat> you cannot shout it from the rooftops, but I actually think there's space for dramatic positive outcomes from it. Um, and so asking this community to leave space and attention for those stories that are not going to be the most extreme, either in positive or negative ways, but I think can be extremely valuable. Alicia, thank you for that, for that you know, reminder. You know, one of the interesting things that I can say about the report, you know, the, the, looking at the 50 years of, of our report is that the movement of countries along the continuum from partly free to free has slowed. That's one of the things that is notable about the last 15 years. So I think that really kind of butchers you to your point that we need to pay much more attention to those partly free countries and figure out how to nurture democracies in those places, you know, like Ukraine that genuinely want to be free and strong democracies and, uh, and, and, and need support. Leo, you have the last word. No, thank you. Um, first, I, I want to elaborate on something that Nuri said. He said that China is committed to, um, to crush democracy and to uh, expand this, this model of autocracy. On February 4th of last year, 20 days before the invasion, uh, Russia and China um, presented a, a, a common statement. Um, within that statement, they clearly said that China and Russia will uh, stand together and join efforts to crush color revolutions. We all know that color revolutions is a proxy uh, used by them to pro-democracy and freedom movements. So it's very clear that China and Russia are committed to um, not let democracy pass anywhere. Uh, and when they, wherever they can see uh, the support to autocratic tendencies, they will do that. Wherever they can support autocratic regimes to hold on power, they will do that. So I think that this needs to be a clear uh, signal that democracies need to engage to support this type of movements, to support the movements of the people who are willing to take the streets, to go to the voting booth, uh, to uh, organize themselves towards democracy. Um, the second idea for closing is that mm, to recognize that the struggle for democracy and freedom is a, a huge challenge that no organization, no government, no individual, no movement will be able to take uh, um, solely. So we need to always think of the network capacity that we can build. You are doing a great job at, at Freedom House um, by doing the report and many of the activities, but I think we need to put the networking build of capacity at the center stage. And when I think of network, is the network of activists, movements, the network of NGOs, of independent organizations, of governments, of the private sectors and of regular citizens. We need to figure out ways of horizontal networking where people can do different things that go towards the same objective, which is giving people more rights, giving people more strength, giving people more confidence to uh, struggle for and defend democracy. And finally, I want to thank you, Mike, uh, Nicole, uh, and, and the great team, and also the panelists, Rachel, uh, Alison, uh, Nuri, and, and yourself for making this happen. It's, it's been great, and I believe that this information needs to be spread out through the networks that we need to continue to build. <laughs> well, listen, so thank you very much. Well, first of all, let me thank all the panelists. I wish we could give you a standing ovation, but we're going to give you a virtual standing ovation. Mm -hmm. That was really a great conversation. Uh, I really also deeply appreciate all of your partnership. I think the point that you made, Leo, that this is a that this is a partnership. Uh, that this is not the that that's not the responsibility or the obligation of one group or individual, but all of us together. I think that's really a very inspiring note to end on. I also want to thank the incredible Freedom House team uh, for another great report uh, and also a great outreach. Uh, we're already briefing a lot of key people on this report, and we hope that next year when we gather again, 
that will have even better news to report. And I, I truly think that we we can if we do some of the things that Freedom House and this panelist, uh, these panelists are recommending. So with that, I think we are done. And thank you all for being with us. Uh, and we'll see you a year from now, but probably before then too. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you very much.